Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dr. Amanda Goldsrud, um, and I'm going to be co-presenting today with my colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Logason. We're both from the UCLA Center for Autism Research and Treatment, and we're going to be talking with you today about advances in the research and treatment of adults with ASD. And we decided to focus our talk on five main areas of concern and um, areas where we think there needs to be more service and treatment attention. And I thought I would start by giving you a good case example from a 40-year-old I saw in clinic recently, let's call him John uh, for these purposes. And interestingly, his parents, his elderly parents who were about 70 years old initiated this consult with me and they had concerns across the board, but developmentally early on, he primarily carried a diagnosis of ADHD, not autism, but they kind of mentioned throughout life, he had some quirks and social run-ins and he was quite bullied in childhood. And he just really had a failure to launch is what they um, you know, understood or described. And so if we look at these five areas of concern, if we think about John, post-secondary education is a main concern. And for John, he actually did successfully make the transition from high school to college. But unfortunately, he got to college and within six months, he suffered a severe bout of depression that was quite disabling. He dropped out and unfortunately now at the age of 40 has not continued his education. In terms of independent living and independent functioning, well, he's still living primarily with his parents. He has never lived outside the home. His parents who are aging are very concerned about who's going to help care for John when they are no longer able to. And so this is a real concern in our community. Who is going to do the caretaking uh, when the caretakers are aging themselves? Another area of concern is in mental health. I mentioned before that John's depression was part of the reason he had to drop out of his community college. And we know that mental health concerns are such an impactful part of an adult with autism's life. If they carry a comorbid diagnosis, their outcomes are worse. John had depression. He also had panic attacks and anxiety that are really debilitating. Social emotional development also continues to be an area of concern and a focus for treatment. And, you know, luckily, John has um, mentioned that he's had several um, successful relationships with women that he's, he has dated. He currently is not dating anyone. And this is actually his primary area of concern. Um, he would like to be in a stable relationship. His parents are very concerned about this. They think that he's socially naive um, and they're concerned that he won't find the right partner who will be able to support him. And our fifth area we're gonna highlight today is that of employment. And for John in particular, he is a brilliant musician. Um, he's played the piano his whole life. He's really good at it, but he hasn't been able to find the right career that focuses on those skills. And so for now, he's working at the local Trader Joe's, and he reports pretty high dissatisfaction with that. He really would be liking to follow his passion, but it's really hard to break into the industry. And so these five areas are what we're going, and themes are what we're going to think about today when we think about both the barriers and the successes for adults on the autism spectrum. So to think about this, we, um, we here's a timeline of the disorder. And I, I show this because autism, as it's coined, is a relatively new phenomenon. And unfortunately, we haven't had many adults age into adulthood to be able to follow them long term and understand developmental trajectories and outcomes. In fact, a large majority, almost 70% of all people who carry an autism diagnosis are actually under the age of 14. So that means there's a lot more to come. Um, and we really need to be focused on the area of adulthood. A recent, I thought this was interesting, a recent review article. So I'm used to um, uh, 
citing the statistic that 50,000 individuals with autism will turn 18 every year. Well, that is almost doubled now. A recent statistic shows about 70 to 100,000 individuals with ASD will turn 18 this year. And so that really highlights the need for aggressive reform, service expansion, more mental health services, transition services to really meet the needs of this growing population. But unfortunately, we really have a lack of research into service support in adulthood. And uh, Paul Shattuck and his colleagues recently did a review article and found that over the past 10 years, so over the past decade, there were only 52 studies that had been done to look at services for adults on the spectrum. And that represents less than 1% of the overall autism research. Um, which is really quite stunning. Um, an even smaller minority, 15 studies, looked at any type of social intervention for these adults on the spectrum. And an even smaller amount, 11, looked at any type of post-secondary education support for individuals with ASD. And so we really are in a critical period for us. We need to understand how to support adults, but we really are lacking um, empirically supported treatments and services um, in our community. So let's start with what we know about post-secondary education. It's fairly well established now that less than 50% of these youth with ASD will participate in post-secondary education within two years of finishing high school. And these are lower rates than many other disability groups. And so uniquely in autism, we're having a hard time figuring out how to support individuals post high school into these education settings. Unfortunately, there's an, an interaction also with socioeconomic status in that lower income households are having an even more difficult time with this transition. We do recently have some randomized control trials that have been looking at college support programs to support that transition from high school to college. One that I wanna highlight now is called the STEPS program. It's for individuals with ASD between 16 and 25. And what I really like about this program is it actually worked in two steps. The first step being in high school. So preparing that high schooler with counseling sessions, with college visit days, um, with paired educator trainings to really get that young adult on the spectrum ready to transition to a college setting. And then in step two, there were weekly, weekly counseling sessions during that transition when that young adult was in college um, and also community outings, social interactions that really were focused on how can we support that young adult and have them be more successful in college settings. And um, the intervention itself, the randomized control trial, um, focused on several key areas, um, including self-determination, self-knowledge, and emotion regulation, all looking at independence building and success. And the results of this trial, um, you know, it's a small scale trial at this point. Um, I hope it will be scaled um, you know, more greatly in the future. But step one did find immediate effects of readiness for that transition um, during high school, which is great. And that maintained um, after that transition period. In step two, the trial found increased improvements in college adjustment, which we would hope that that would be with, with the more targeted supports. But unfortunately, you see that drop off a bit in the follow-up period, suggesting a need for continued support um, throughout a longer period of transition, for sure. Next, we're gonna look at the area of independent living. And this is an area of concern for many stakeholders who work with individuals with ASD. And I think what's unique about ASD is that although other disability groups seem across the, the lifetime to make slow and steady improvements in adaptive functioning or independent skills, 
In autism, we see a very different pattern. And regardless of IQ, we see a, essentially an acceleration during kind of childhood and then an actual decrease in daily living skills as that individual ages. And so this shows a unique and difficult challenge that we have with the, with the autism population. They're actually declining in their independent living skills once, as you could imagine, the services, the, the service rich landscape of childhood and high school is gone. And so what do we know about some of the programs that have focused on daily living skills and independence in adults on the spectrum? Well, to highlight one, the McGill Transition Program, um, this is a 10-week course to help with the transition to adulthood. Um, in the immediate treatment group, this was an immediate treatment versus a waitlist control design. Um, the individuals ranked significantly higher in areas of self-determination and self-assessed quality of life, which we know is very important. Um, but unfortunately, we find that effect again where few participants actually retain these skills over the year, again, suggesting a need for, for maintenance, booster sessions to support these outcomes. And we see here um, the graphs of this trial um, from pre to post and improvements in these areas of social communication and interaction, self-determination, and in the area of kind of working with others in the community. So we have some nice positive findings as of late for these kind of transition focused programs to support individuals with autism into adulthood. I want to take a moment to pause and talk a little bit about self-determination. Um, it's become kind of a buzzword, I think, out in the community. This idea, a set of beliefs or knowledge and skills that promote self-directed independent behaviors, so important. So many adults I see and their parents want to improve this area um, in their development. And the goal of really any intervention program would be to help build up skills to make better choices, to set goals, to problem solve, to improve that individual's own self-efficacy and advocacy about being on the spectrum. We know that self-determined determination relates to successful independent living outcomes. I wanna highlight it because um, it has become more well known and it's become a more important treatment target. I think it's separate from, if you're in California, the self determination regional center system, which is the same idea, but it's actually a service access program for, for adults on the, on the spectrum, and I think for individuals of any age on the spectrum, where that individual can determine the services they receive. But this idea of self-determination really carries throughout a lot of the work recently on adults on the spectrum. And one program that really highlights this again is the ACCESS program. Um, and this is developed by um, our friends at UC Davis. It is a 19-session um, program, and it targets a range of areas in terms of adaptive functioning and social and coping skills. Again, that focus on self-determination to really increase the independence of adults. And I think that's a real critical piece here. Um, it's an integrated treatment program that combines social skills training, cognitive behavioral therapy, group therapy, and also highlights working with care caregivers and caretakers. Um, and there are some at least preliminary results that show some nice increases in, in the, the skills we would want to see, such as, you know, adaptive skills, independent living, um, and again, that self-determination. So I think there is some promising work um, that is coming out now. I think you know, these trials need to be tested um, with larger samples um, and with different types of rigorous designs to really make sure um, that they're working and to understand how they're working. But um, it's really exciting to see the field moving in this direction. Next, I wanna focus a little bit on caretakers. Um, caretakers are, getting older themselves, 
there is a there was a relatively new survey that came out in 2020 that showed that these older caretakers have much higher financial burden, um, much poorer um, outcomes in terms of their own mental and physical health, and that the the biggest predictor of the parent stress was these acute mental health crises and challenging behaviors in their loved one with autism. And the thing that predicted the best outcomes for these parents was a high quality transition planning program. And so I think this really supports this idea that we really need to focus on that critical period of transition, flushing support there, um, you know, having family centered approaches that are really supporting the whole family through this very critical transition into adulthood. And next, mental health. I, I mentioned that mental health, you know, the caretakers acknowledge that this is a huge concern. This is a huge concern in the adult population. We know that an estimate 30 to 50% of young adults with ASD will carry a, a co-occurring psychiatric condition. Um, the Kaiser Permanente Group um, in Northern California has done a lot of work in this area using um, the Kaiser Permanente Medical Records System, have found that you know, individuals with ASD are most likely to suffer from a host of psychiatric issues such as ADHD, anxiety, bipolar, depression, and even medical comorbidity as well. Things like obesity, sleep disturbance, neurological issues, um, diabetes, heart disease, the list goes on. So there is a real concern here to address the kind of comorbid conditions in adulthood. And luckily we've seen some improvement in this area as well. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy has emerged, you know, it's an empirically supported treatment, but it really has emerged with a with an evidence base for its use with individuals with ASD. Um, and revisiting the STEPS program I mentioned earlier in the talk, that program that was really targeted on the transition period actually showed collateral improvement on depression symptoms as well. And that used a cognitive behavioral framework. So we see that we can kind of treat multiple um, concerns maybe simultaneously with these programs. I do need to highlight though, that we also are concerned about the difficulty um, transferring these empirically supported treatments into the community setting. And so a recent study looked at community clinicians perspectives and found that, that by and large, many of them had significant difficulty, um, less favorable attitudes about working with individuals with ASD, even though they were CBT trained, they didn't believe that it would be um, successful with their, their ASD clients. And so this really highlights the challenges of providing high quality mental health treatment in our communities, and it really should be a, a focus of attention moving forward. And now I'm going to pass the torch on to Dr. Elizabeth Lawson. Okay, well, thank you so much to my colleague, Dr. Amanda Galsrud, for that excellent overview of post-secondary education, independent living, and mental health for adults with autism. Um, we're now going to talk a little bit about social emotional development and employment for adults with autism. Now, when we refer to social emotional development, that could encompass a lot of things. So for the purpose of, of this talk, we're gonna focus on romantic relationships, sexual relationships, and friendships. Now, we know that social skills training in particular has been one of the more popular methods for enhancing social emotional development for individuals with autism. And many social skills interventions really are available that focus on early childhood through adolescence. However, there's very few social skills interventions focused on adults with autism. There are a limited um, availability of evidence-based treatments for um, social emotional development for younger adults with autism. Um, none of those studies have long-term follow-up studies examining um, maintenance of, of treatment gains over time. And really there's a dearth of, of social skills interventions for middle-aged and older adults with autism. 
Now, with regard to romantic and sexual relationships, adults with autism often, as I think most of us know, have difficulty developing and maintaining romantic relationships, even though many will say that they really want to have these relationships, they just often don't know how to. And as a result, they're often less likely to date or to marry. Um, they tend to have fewer romantic relationships and often experience, you know, greater romantic loneliness. Um, in some cases, even the literature will suggest that there's a higher incidence of stalking behavior in this population. And in fairness to these young adults, you know, I don't think they're always stalking the person. If you think about the intent uh, behind the behavior, it's, it's often just that they don't know how to let the person know that they like them. And so they might engage in behaviors that look like stalking. They might show up at their work or their home and not realize how that might make that other person feel and how that could be frightening. Um, we also know that many young adults with autism have difficulty developing um, and maintaining healthy sexual relationships. So they tend to have less sexual knowledge and awareness. They're more likely to obtain their sex education um, online, on the internet, um, even porn sites. Um, and they are often at higher risk for sexual victimization and even financial exploitation from partners. Um, knowing all of this, there's still a paucity of treatments to provide um, support in developing and maintaining these romantic relationships and, and sexual intimacy for adults with autism. Now, there's very, very few studies that, that focus on things like dating skills, but we wanted to highlight one in the literature. It was a program developed by Allie Cunningham at Florida Atlantic University. It's called a, the Relationship Enhancement Program. And in this study, um, Cunningham and colleagues had an eight week program um, with two hour weekly meetings. And they had 38 participants in this study with autism that were assigned to either a treatment group or a control group. And you can see the demographics of the, the sample there on the screen. Um, and the relationship enhancement program was actually based on a pre-existing program called the Ready for Love program that was developed by Gurney. And this is a psychoeducational treatment that has over 20 years of you know, empirical research to support its effectiveness with different populations, but it really hadn't been studied with those with autism. And so um, Cunningham and her colleagues decided to add some lessons that were particularly poignant and important for adults in the spectrum. They utilized lessons from the Peers from Young Adults program from UCLA, um, and they added lessons on things like flirting, uh, assessing romantic interest, and also asking someone on a date. And this is essentially what they found. So in comparing that treatment group to the control group, they found that those who went through the relationship enhancement program really improved in their overall social responsiveness, um, particularly in the areas of social communication and social motivation, even experienced decreases in restricted interest and repetitive behaviors. Um, their dating assertion was definitely improved over this, this short program, as well as their empathy skills. So um, nice, interesting research in an area that really Really has been under understudied. Um, we also wanted to highlight some programs around psychosexual education. And again, there's very little out there in the, in the research literature, but one study that I think is worth mentioning is the Tackling Teenage Program. Now this is out of the Netherlands and this um, study was um, conducted by uh, Kirsten Visser at Erasmus University. Um, this was a study with 189 participants that were assigned to either a treatment um, group or a control group. And they received in the treatment group 18 weekly sessions um, using this training manual and workbook for um, youth from anywhere from 12 to 18 years of age. And you see there's a variety of topics that were covered um, in this program. And again, these were individual treatment settings that also incorporated parents into the treatment. Now, overall, all what they found in this study was that participants demonstrated increased knowledge of psychosexual themes, of um, improvements in interpersonal boundaries, um, following the training. And although they included both teens and young adults in this study, they really found that the treat was, was most effective for um, young teenagers, about 12 to 14 years of age. Unfortunately, the program wasn't found to be effective in um, improving skills related to romantic relationships or reducing problematic sexual behaviors. But if you look more closely at the data, something that was interesting that came out of this study was not only that the, um, the youth themselves improved in their psychosexual knowledge, but parents also improved in their knowledge of their child's psychosexual knowledge and also adequate boundaries with their child. So that was encouraging. 
Now, with regard to friendship, we know this is another area of psycho sort of social emotional development. Um, we know that a lot of adults on the spectrum do have difficulty developing and maintaining friendships. Um, as Dr. Goldsrud mentioned, uh, many of these adults are less likely to be engaged in post-secondary education or employment, as we'll, we'll soon discover, which limits their access to peers. Um, so it's not surprising then that they tend to be involved in less social activities. They have fewer get-togethers with friends, they have fewer friends essentially, and really experience um, greater social isolation upon entering adulthood. You also heard from Dr. Goldsrud that there's a higher incidence of mental health problems among adults on the spectrum. Things like anxiety and depression in particular are at very high rates. And many people hypothesize that it might be related to this social isolation that really is experienced by many young adults and, and older adults on the spectrum, as well as a lack of access access to treatment services. The bottom line though is that even though we know that there's a lot of difficulties around friendship development and maintenance for adults on the spectrum, there's still a lack of services to improve friendships and, and relationships for adults and, and a lack of evidence-based treatments as well. So this leads us to the UCLA Peers for Young Adults program. This is a program that um, we started to develop back in 2007. So it's been around for a while. There's been numerous papers on this study or this particular program. And um, this is a 16 week curriculum that's for young adults with autism and other social challenges. Um, they have 90 minute weekly sessions where our young adults attend the program along with some type of a social coach. So it might be a parent or a sibling, it might be a job coach or a life coach or a peer mentor. Um, and the, the focus of the intervention is on helping these young adults develop and maintain uh, friendships and also um, romantic relationships, as well as handling things like conflict and rejection. Now, as I mentioned, there's been numerous papers um, published on this intervention, both in UCLA and outside of UCLA. And overall, basically what we find with this, this program is that we get a nice increase in social skills knowledge, um, nice improvements in things like empathy and assertion, cooperation, even social motivation improves. Um, and also we see often very much um, a decrease in things like like autistic mannerisms and even loneliness. Um, and looking at the data a little bit closer, um, this uh, represents a study that we published a few years back that looks at both um, a, a treatment versus a delayed treatment control group. The blue line here is the delayed treatment control group and the yellow line is our treatment group. T1 to T2 is sort of the waiting period where nothing is really happening in terms of treatment. Um, T2 to T3 is the treatment period and then T3 to T4 is the follow-up 16 weeks after the intervention. And what you see here is a nice improvement in decreased autistic mannerisms on the social responsiveness scale in both the treatment treatment and delay treatment control group during that treatment condition with a nice maintenance 16 weeks later. Same thing when you look at overall social skills and the social responsiveness scale, nice improvement during the treatment phase. Again, that maintains nicely 16 weeks later. And then also when you look at things like social engagement, we're also seeing this trend where both groups are improving in their um, numbers of, of hosted and both invited get togethers, um, not only over the course of treatment, but also with that nice maintenance 16 weeks later. So that takes us through a little bit of, of some of the work that's being done in social emotional development. Now I want to move into employment. So um, we happen to know that, you know, employment is one of those areas that's really, really been understudied for adults with um, autism. And, and really, there's just such a, a lack of services as well. We know that um, adults in the spectrum have greater underemployment as well as unemployment. So only about 58% of young adults with autism actually hold employment in the first six years years after high school. Um, of those that are employed, there's a higher underemployment rate where about 97% in one recent estimate of young adults with autism who were employed were only working part-time and 85% of those were working between 11 to 20 hours per week. Um, of those that are employed, they have um, a more likelihood to be either dismissed or terminated or to discontinue employment themselves. Um, sadly, too, a lot of these individuals, they have fewer internship um, or training opportunities prior to going onto the job market. And so that's also sort of discrepant with their, their more typically developing peers. And sadly, because of these outcomes, they're less likely to live independently, as we've heard from Dr. Galsrud. 
Now, even though we know that these outcomes are not looking so great, there's still a lack of services to prepare adults um, with autism for employment. Now, the past employment interventions that have been found to be effective, um, are, it's great, but they tend to be a little bit limited in scope. So they don't tend to be very comprehensive. Um, a lot of the interventions have focused specifically on things like interviewing skills, or maybe difficult workplace you know, relationships. Um, supported employment programs have looked very promising where people will rotate through internships um, with you know, sort of on the job coaching, but again, maybe not teaching soft skills that could be beneficial to um, the adult on the spectrum. And so very few program programs have actually focused on those soft skills that I just referred to. Um, and very, very few programs are actually comprehensive incorporating many of these different elements. So among the limited um, employment interventions, again, most of these interventions have focused once again on young adults and, and very, very few have focused on middle-aged or older adults. So in terms of supported employment, what that really involves is um, you know, incorporating the whole system and not only working with the individual with autism, but also providing support to employers and really kind of enhancing that feedback loop where everybody's sort of in communication. And so supportive employment has actually been shown to be very effective for transition aged youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities and particularly effective for young adults with autism that have graduated from high school. Um, now, individuals with autism who received supported employment have been shown to have significantly higher employment rates ultimately compared to those without support. So in one study, 63% um, employed were employed when receiving supported employment and only 43% were employed when they were not receiving supported employment. Um, when you're looking at those that do receive supported employment, about 73% of young adults with autism who were employed actually got that sort of support in their work environment with some sort of job coaching. And of that group, 53% got job coaching daily. So this is definitely um, an area that we want to study further and, and, and try to incorporate into other programs. Project Search is probably the most successful program in terms of um, being um, very well studied. And so this is a transition to work internship program where they provide job experiences and internships and they identify job preferences for um, individuals and put them into these job experiences and internships. And it's been implemented at over 400 sites worldwide. It's actually been used with a variety of people um, from different disability groups. And in one study um, that was published by Wayman and colleagues, they um, used Project Search in addition to some ASD supports to help to obtain and um, you know, maintain successful employment. And the way that they defined successful employment in the study was that they wanted this to be year round competitive integrated employment for no less than 16 hours per week. Now, what they did was a multi-site parallel block randomized control trial, and this was with 156 adults between 18 to 21 years of age with autism. And you'll see on the, the graph there that the dark line is the treatment group and the gray line is the control group. And in the treatment group, they received three separate 10 to 12 week unpaid internships over the course of the year. And then they followed up a year after this training program and they found that 73% of those who went through that treatment without the three different internships um, had acquired competitive integrated employment at or above minimum wage, at least within a year of going through the program compared to only 17% that um, was in the control group. So clearly this is working. Um, but the idea is that again, this is very focused on internships and job training. And so this sort of leads us to the idea that we had here at UCLA to create more of a college to career transition program that would be a little bit more comprehensive and maybe even include some of those soft skills that we were talking about. So Peers for Careers is a program that Dr. Amanda Galsrud and I have been um, studying and testing for the last several years. Um, this is a college to career transition program that's really designed to and developed um, to increase and enhance those soft skills that are needed to obtain and maintain um, competitive integrative employment. And in this pilot study that we conducted with 12 adults on the autism spectrum, we um, provided this, this intervention using a career coaching model where the young adults were paired with a career coach. It was an undergraduate or graduate student that was interested in supporting um, adults in the spectrum and they're seeking employment. And we created coaching dyads based on a, a speed coaching event where they kind of interviewed each other and rated how much they wanted to be coached 
identify that person or how much they wanted to coach that individual. And ultimately everyone received a career coach and they went through this 10 week course that was sort of like the equivalent of a three unit class where they would come to the program twice a week for um, 90 minutes at a time. And they received didactic lessons and all of the skills that you see here on the screen. Um, there were role play demonstrations to highlight the skills. There were behavioral rehearsal exercises where they were practicing the skills with the career coaches. And then they would spend up to about seven hours per week just sort of practicing the skills in these homework assignments. And this is essentially what we found from this small pilot study. Um, first of all, the, um, the young adults definitely improved in their overall kind of employment social skills knowledge from pre to post test and that maintained nicely 60 or 10 weeks after um, the program. But what was sort of interesting about that, that knowledge of employment related social skills was that after the intervention, the adults with autism were really equivalent to where the career coaches were when they came into the study. So we're sort of taking them to this sort of acceptable level of what our employment knowledge and social skills need to be in order to hopefully obtain um, and maintain employment. Um, this is sort of looking at their perceived preparedness for employment. And what you'll notice is that about a little bit more than a quarter of the, the group came in feeling very prepared for, um, for employment. The others sort of varied a bit. At the end of that 10 week treatment program, almost half of the group felt very prepared, but everyone felt at least very prepared or somewhat prepared for employment at the end of the 10 week course. And then when they came back 10 weeks later at follow up, almost everyone was feeling very prepared. And in fact, that really was reflected in our employment outcomes. So if you look at sort of the comparison between pre and post treatment, about 40% of our young adults were employed when they first entered the program. When they left our program um, just 10 weeks later, they were about 60% of them were employed. And when you looked at even the drops, we had a couple of drops in this pilot program and both were dropping for um, employment related reasons. Um, when you look at those drops, we actually were at 67% of our sample um, employed at the end of that 10 week course. So um, that was a nice pilot study that was sort of showing that this was a feasible kind of acceptable intervention, but we're very excited to share that we um, are uh, currently conducting a randomized control trial to further test this intervention, but with a supported employment um, sort of addition to the intervention. And so this was funded by Autism Speaks um, this is an adult transition research grant. And again, the, the target is to develop um, social competence and related skills in the work setting using things like didactic instruction and career coaching and the supported employment. We, um, based on a needs assessment, modified the program from a 10 week course, which was a little bit too fast um, for a lot of our young adults to a 20 week course where they come once a week for about two and a half hours. Um, that 20 week course, which teaches all those soft skills related to employment, then um, leads into a 10 week supported employment or internship opportunity. So now they're getting that on the job training um, and then there's a 10 week follow-up assessment. What we're really examining in this study though is the impact of career coaching. So half of our sample is randomized to receive a career coach at the beginning of the study. And then halfway through the study, when we complete the didactic course, we re-randomize our participants to receive a coach or not. And we're really looking at that active greeting ingredient of that career coaching. But again, with the addition of having sort of um, not only these internship and employment opportunities, but also employer training and support. So really having a more comprehensive program to enhance employment outcomes for adults with autism. So just to some kind of final key points to, to talk about, um, as Dr. Golzer had mentioned, um, estimates now are that about 70 to 100,000 individuals with autism are entering adulthood every year. Um, and yet only 2% of autism research has focused on adults. Um, so not surprising, there's been a, a huge lack of services and evidence-based treatments to support this sort of ever-growing population. And, and even though we've highlighted some really promising programs, you know, in this talk um, and in these various areas, there, there obviously needs um, to be a lot more done. Um, so fortunately, we are able to share a few research opportunities with all of you. These are a few of the studies that are being done, treatment studies for adults with autism at UCLA. I had mentioned the Peers for Careers College to Career Transition Program. And this is a flyer that highlights that particular program. We also have a, a peers for dating um, study currently going on. It's another randomized control trial, 16 week intervention 
um, that's teaching skills related to developing and maintaining romantic relationships for adults. And so that's also open for enrollment. And then additionally, we also have a program that's focused more on friendships. This is the Peers L DOPA study, and it's both for teens and for young adults. Um, it's a free intervention, um, along with um, the possibility of either receiving the drug L DOPA or a placebo. And if you know anything about the drug L-DOPA, it increases the amount of dopamine in the brain. And the idea behind the study is that maybe by you know, increasing the amount of dopamine in the brain, we could actually make socialization more rewarding. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Goldsworth, to share a little bit more about some of our basic science studies. Hello, everyone. Hello again. Um, so uh, UCLA CART also has several basic science studies for adults with autism that I want to highlight for you. Uh, one is the BIGS program. Um, this is looking at kind of social cognition. Um, there is an EEG component looking at developmental and motor assessments. Um, this is a particularly interesting study for those of you interested in the way the brain works um, and brain differences in ASD. We also have two genetic studies. Um, the first is looking primarily at individuals um, from African-American descent, and the, we're looking at the genetics um, behind autism in that community, and that's for individuals of all ages can participate and their caretakers. And we also have the SPARK study which is also a genetic study. It is not focused on just one certain population, um, such as the other study that's looking just at black communities. Um, but again, we will enroll individuals across the lifespan and their caretakers and their siblings. Um, and we are interested again in the genetics behind autism. And so you can see our center has a lot of opportunities for you. Um, if you have a loved one on the spectrum, if you are on the spectrum yourself, or or um, you're in the community and want to link uh, individuals you know to our center. And finally, I think we're just gonna advance one more slide here. Good, we would just like to end with a few acknowledgements, um, especially to our funding partners um, and our donors who have generously supported our work. This includes Autism Speaks, the Organization for Autism Research, Northwestern Mutual, John Clem and Cho Lei, and the Garden Schwartz family. Um, also a special thanks to the UCLA CARP faculty that um, are wonderful colleagues of ours. Um, and all the trainees and staff who make this work possible. And of course, we could not do this without the families um, who participate in this research. So thank you, thank you. Uh, for more information, you can see our number and our information email. And we look forward to discussing more with you at our um, discussion on April 30th. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. Take care, bye-bye.